And good afternoon. Welcome into Market Talk for Tuesday, May 4th. Great to be with you here. Good afternoon. I'm your host, Jesse Allen. Thank you for joining us for another edition of Market Talk. You can find us online, markettalkag.com. That's our home on the web. You can find our social media links there, our YouTube channel to watch and listen to the podcast uh, there on demand and find all the archives. You can also get all of our streaming sources via our website, our radio affiliates, and so much more. It's all online at markettalkag.com. Well, a lot to talk about in the grain markets today. Another bullish move to the upside. Let's bring in Jim McCormick with agmarket.net joining us here this afternoon. Jim, great to have you back on. And I joked a little bit uh, before we got going. I need that old OJ song, Money, 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 playing in the background because, man, oh, man, this is uh, this is just getting to be crazy looking at this market, Jim. It is. It's money, money, money is a good way to put it. The kind of money it's we're talking about, but also it's the money it takes to trade it right now, Jesse. Uh, one thing we want to point out to people is you're, you know, it feels like we're seeing crazy volatility. And the reality is it is. Right now, the July beans are trading an average range of about range of about 38 cents. A year ago, it was around 12 cents. July corn. 25 cents. Mind you, that's limit move up until this week. The limits are now 40. Up until this week, we were literally trading an average range in the July corn was 25 cents. A year ago this time, it was around eight. So this is extreme volatility for producers that you're seeing and traders that you're feeling. This is something that is, I would not just call it unprecedented, but it's definitely up there. In a, you know, we don't see it too often. We don't see it too often, and I, I think it's something for a lot of uh, produce, not only producers, but for for fund managers, for brokers, for everybody. It's it, it's almost got to be nauseating at times to watch this because it's just it's you're looking at this market and seeing the wild volatility, and you don't know what's going to happen one day to the next. Exactly. I mean, at times we we are commenting in our office that at times it almost feels like it's untradeable because you know, the movements are so violent, you know, one minute you're trading up five and you go get a cup of coffee and you're up 15. It's that quick and that hard. But the reality is there is a reason why we're doing this. We have definitely got a very tight situation in the world with Brazil's dryness issues and it continues to get tighter. Um, you know, there's a lot of estimates say that crop's going to drop below hundred million ton crop out of Brazil. If it drops down to below hundred down to mid nineties, that's the reality. It's about 400 million bushels of corn that's going to come off the market that we've got to either ration that demand or provide a new supplier of it. And the market in the United States is bidding up thinking that we may be that supplier. Well, and let's focus on that Brazil uh, topic here a little bit. That seems to be the biggest driver out of everything that's in the market right now. I know uh, some folks are lowering their estimates for that Brazilian crop. I saw today, I think the the poor rating for corn in Paraná was up to 27% now. So, I mean, you mentioned it. That Brazilian story keeps getting worse by the day, and that forecast is not looking good here for the next two weeks. So, I mean, it, we look at Brazil – we lose some of that corn demand, or we lose some of that corn there, shifts demand to the U.S. I mean, I feel like that could really explode this corn market even higher than what it is right now. I think you're 100% right. I mean, that crop right now, a lot of people putting it, so the government's around 112. A lot of people got it down near 100. Um, what What's going on, folks, plain and simple, is this corn crop got planted up to a month later than normal due to the wet season of the beans. They couldn't get the beans out, couldn't get the corn in. The problem is, they run into their monsoon season ends and they pretty much don't get the rainfall. And right now, unfortunately for them is their monsoon season is ending as we speak. And there's just not a lot of rain coming in right now in the forecast. They're in that critical pollination phase. And if they, you know, anybody who's been in a drought knows if you start missing these rains during pollination, it continues. It's not, you know, it's not if your crop will get smaller, it's just how much smaller it's gonna get. And what happens is we still have the world to feed. You still have these livestock to feed. The ethanol industry is making money. So the world suppliers are saying, well, you know, buyers, excuse me, that normally say, hey, I usually going to buy these Brazilian beans. They've now got to scramble to find another supplier. And that's what's pushing our market up near term because uh, we're trying to price out because our stocks are already tight. You take these, you know, if we fill that void, Jesse, for this old crop beat, can we carry out? We'll drop below a billion bushels, which is essentially desperately you know, we're very razor thin some margins. And now you look what's going on with the new crop. It's getting planted, planted at a great rate. But man, is it dry in the United States? And that's got some people spooked as well. 
That does have people spooked as well. And that's another thing I've been hearing from a lot of producers. Basically, west of the Mississippi is that, you know, it's dry. They need some rains. I know parts of Iowa and Minnesota have caught some rains here the last few days. But, I mean, they're dry. And especially up in the Dakotas, that's a totally different story with the dryness there. And and one has to wonder what could happen uh, here if we move through the summer months and don't catch those rains. But also, like you kind of alluded to, we seem to be pricing in some of this uh, this weather premium into this market. And for producers, it, it presents a great opportunity for marketing. But you also have to be smart about your marketing right now. Well, that's it. I mean, the reality is it's given us a great opportunity uh, where, you know, we're telling, you know, if a customer calls up and says, should I sell some five, 575 corn? Yes. I don't think it's a wrong idea. You're locking the profits. We would recommend maintaining some kind of ownership via either a vertical call strategy or an out of money call. Why is that? Because the reality is this. Our stocks are so dang on tight. If we would have a weather problem, Jesse, kind of like we had not as bad as 2012, but just take five, seven bushels off our trend yield, our carryouts are going to easily drop below a billion, a billion bushels. And then the question is, how high do you have to go to ration demand? And 73, we had the what call was gone as a great grain robbery. Russia came in and bought a lot of that grain. And then I believe we had a drought in 74. The market exploded higher. If you kind of look at that as our analog type of year, you could argue $10 plus corn, $20 plus beans is what it would take to knock out the knock out some end user demand. And it's plain and simple. There's guys out there right now, Jesse, are delivering some four dollar, four twenty five corn that was sold six months ago, and guys are spotting corn out at seven. That could happen this fall if we have a drought. You could be selling what you think is a great price of corn at five bucks, five twenty five, and your neighbor's delivering ten dollar corn. The worst case scenario out there, why you want to have a call, folks, I believe, is the spreads. If you look what happened to the May corn and the July corn, that spread widened at sixty sixty five cents. We've heard there's a commercial in the industry that was caught short of 40, 45,000 contracts of these May contracts because they had the physical con grain on hand, which means they had to be short. They did not get that contract moved out fast enough to the July. When that spread moved and May essentially traded at a premium to July of 60 cents, it was essentially a $90 million loss they took. So if you're a producer right now and you've got a bunch of, let's say you hedge, a bunch of D21 corn at say at $6 to keep it simple. And the market goes to 10, okay? And unfortunately, you're the reason it went to 10 is because you don't have a crop. And then what are you gonna do? You gotta buy out of that crop or you're gonna say, well, maybe I'll roll that crop to 2022. Well, the problem is you're gonna sell that crop at six. The new crop, 22 crop, if we go to 10, the 22 crop won't go up as fast. It may be at eight. So you're going to sell it at six, you're going to lose $4 on the roll, and then you're really going to be down hard, and you're going to get caught in the same situation that that commercial did as on a really bad bearish roll. So you want to have those calls against your position in case for some reason you don't have the bushels this year. And I think that's something that a lot of producers are concerned about. I've heard that question from multiple folks here the last uh, couple of weeks is they're afraid to market too much going back to the weather potential issues here in the U.S. And I think that that has a lot of producers worried to the point where they're maybe not marketing as much as uh, as they would or should. They're, they're kind of incrementing those sales in a little bit on the new crop side. They are. You know, and if you're a producer out there, there's ways to mitigate it. Like I said, sell, you know, sell the cash, buy a call. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it is just consider an option strategy. Buy a put, maybe sell a put, and just put somewhat of a floor in place that protects your equity in case the market goes down. I mean, the reality is everyone's bulled up right now. It's exciting. We're in a definitely in a bull market, but we know what's going on. The reality is we still have a raging pandemic going on in the world. We don't know what's going to happen. You get to the, you know, there's a lot of industries that are really getting hurt bad right now. The livestock sector, you know, feeding cattle right now is, a, is, a, is brutal. If you're involved in the egg industry, that industry has been struggling to make profits for years now. You're going to get to the point where you're going to ration demand. The market doesn't tell you that. It just gets to the point where it washes out and you don't know where it is and you don't want to be the person that misses out on those opportunities. So using puts to protect unpriced grain or using calls against price grain is one way to lock in the profitability, but keep yourself, but keep yourself in the game. 
Well, you mentioned cattle. Let's move over to livestock in that cattle market. Like you said, feeding cattle is a tough business right now. I know the futures trade uh, took it on the chin again today with a rise in corn prices. We did see some early uh, feedlot activity this week, steady to a dollar higher. So I guess that's maybe one positive out there. But overall, this cattle market is just uh, is kind of you know in the seventh round, I would say, with uh, with Muhammad Ali here and just kind of taking it on the chin. It's brutal right now. It almost feels like a deja vu to the industry from six months ago. Um, the market's just having a very hard time, and it's very frustrating. I mean, the the live, the, you know, the feeder guy, you know, the, the guy trying to sell the cattle is not making any money. He's but you look at the packer, and he's making lots of money because it's the reverse of what happened a year ago at this time. You know, the, we had the the chaos of the COVID, but the the retail sector was struggling to fill the consumer demand as consumers are trying to stat, you know, essentially hoard beef. Well, now it's the other way around. The Packers are making a lot of money because it's not the retail end that's exploding. It's now the, the restaurant restaurant end. As we're opening up the United States, then Chicago's saying they hope to be open by 4th of July weekend, fully open. New York's hoping to be fully open by the end of the month. That demand for the, mar- for the commercial industry, the restaurant industry to restock is phenomenal. And that's driving the price up on the packer end. But man, is it frustrating? You're not seeing any on the, you know, I'll sit you on the producer end. Hopefully, we can get to the point where we can start working our way back up. Uh, but right now, it's definitely tough. Yeah, and I I, I feel for those uh, those guys and gals, those cattle ranchers out there, just because. You know, it's hard to say when that point would come where we could start to work our way back up. Is it going to be? couple weeks is it going to be a month a couple months i mean it's really hard to say right now with so much volatility in the grain market well that's it i mean that's part of the problem i think the best thing for the cattle market suggests is just some weakness in the corn market i mean there's a good shot maybe we get through this may wazi report next week a week from today the market kind of takes a breather and we see a little well we got the crop planted break and that'll help do it i mean right now unfortunately you, there's no doubt about it, it feels like you're seeing a fund industry that says buy corn, sell live, sell the live cattle, sell the feeder cattle, and it's been relentless. The hog market, on the other, mark, other hand, continues to hang in there. The hope is maybe that hog market, I mean, hogs trading almost at a premium. The cattle it seems almost unheard of historically, but here we are. But that's the difference between seeing domestic demand as well as international demand is helping keep the hogs up as well as the tightening supply. Hopefully, maybe that will also help support, you know, stabilize the beef industry. Well, and you mentioned hogs. Let's go there and talk about that a little bit more. I mean, we broke through some of those resistance levels here around that 110 mark, and we're starting to churn our way higher in the hog trade. And man, oh man, like like you said, it's hard for me to believe that we could be trading hogs at a premium to live cattle, but we're pretty close to that, Jim. We're right there. And like I said, hopefully that'll stabilize it. I mean, I guess you can make two arguments. Is the cattle going to pull the hogs down? Hopefully not. Hopefully the hogs will, you know, the tight supply of the hog industry, the higher price of hogs will drive some beef demand back into the marketplace is what the hope is. I mean, that's the best thing for the beef market. You know, the cure of cheap prices, sometimes they say it's cheap prices. You get this beef cheap enough where the consumer comes in and starts buying the beef as we go on to the summertime. Like I said, we are opening up the country, and I think that will be positive as we go through the rest of the year. But right now, it's just a plain and simple, just a nasty washout. Jim, I'd like to wrap up today. Uh, you mentioned the WASDE report coming up next week. Uh, I'd love just some of your early thoughts on that. How much uh, is this report? Could this potentially uh, give us volatility in this market? I mean, are you hearing anything early, any, any early indication we could see any sort of major change or surprise in this report? Well, there's two things to look at. On the old crop corn, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of questions about the demand for the old crop corn. What will they do with exports? But if you look at it, the shipments have been phenomenal recently. It looks like China's going to take every kernel of corn they bought. So that could argue the raise the demand on the corn side, on the exports. Ethanol industry is making a lot of money. They could tweak that a little bit higher. And then you take the smaller crop out of Brazil. So there's a very good shot. You'll see demand increase on the old crop, which will tighten the new the ending stocks on the old crop. And then new crop, this is the first new crop estimate of the year. It's going to be interesting to see how they divvy it up. The fact of the matter is with the current acreage estimate and trend yield, you're barely going to meet demand. So you're going to show a very, very tight balance sheet on this report, more than likely, unless they get creative on the demand side of the aspect or just make some surprise adjustments on yield. Same thing for beans. It's a situation that we just don't have enough acreage to meet the current demand estimates. So this is always a tends to be a volatile report, but like I said, this is the first true estimate. We did have the outlook forum meeting 
guesstimate back in February, but that number is actually put out by a different group of, of USDA officials. So this is the first true USDA balance sheet. And, uh, it's not the ending point, it's the beginning point, but it's definitely gonna be debated. And uh, I lean to think it's gonna be look friendly just based on how tight everything looks. Well, it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out as we get to next week with that USDA WASDE report for the month of May. Jim, uh, any other final thoughts you have for us here today? All right, now I just tell the you know people out there, uh, buckle up. Uh, I thought we'd see some volatility this summer. It looks like it's going to come early. I would expect it to get worse before it gets better. But you know, look for opportunities out there. And the big picture for the producers out there, your goal is to sell this crop profitable. You're looking at profitability levels that you haven't seen forever. And don't be afraid to even look out. We've had a lot of producers look at the 22, 23 pricing and not go crazy, but start marketing some of those crop years because in the long run, we do know what happens, Jesse. What goes up does come down. The world will produce a lot of grain. We will ration out demand at these levels. And then eventually we will be in an oversupply situation. So you know, producers out there, you know, give us a call. We'll be able to help you devise some kind of a plan. You want to be able to keep manage the risk, but also take advantage of it in the long run, because uh, these are some phenomenal prices in the long run, we believe. Well, and you mentioned it. Give uh, give you guys a call, and I know you got a great team there at agmarket.net. you got your website. You have the app as well. A lot of tools to help producers uh, with their marketing plans, Jim. Yes, please do. Just go to our, our website, agmarket.net, download the app, and look for our research. Jim, appreciate the time as always. Thanks for joining us, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you for having me. Jim McCormick with agmarket.net, our guest today here on Market Talk. Find us online, markettalkag.com. This has been the Tuesday, May 4th edition of the show. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon.